Hello everyone, my name is Martin, and welcome to Nerds and Stuff. I'm going to be your host and game master for this Star Wars Edge of the Empire campaign entitled Legacy of Ash. Now, this campaign we're about to start is not your normal Star Wars adventure. It's going to have a darker tone, a darker theme, and it's definitely going to have some mature content as far as language and humor. So consider this your warning. Uh, but before we get started on our very first episode, which we're very excited to bring to you, let's go ahead and meet the cast. Hello, my name is Kathy. I'll be playing Triz Locke. Triz is a Zabrak hired gun bodyguard, and she'll be the captain of this group. My name is Sterling, and I will be playing Remy Novus, a Corellian ace hotshot, and I will be the pilot of the group. My name is Daniel, and I will be playing the role of Bruto Lance, a Clatuinian technician modder. Hello, my name is Jenny. I will be playing Ral Ray Var. Var is a Twi'lek and a smuggler slash scoundrel, and she will be the face of the group. Now, this first adventure was built very much like a tutorial. Now, we're doing this for two reasons. Uh, first is for any of you guys at home that have not experienced the Edge of the Empire role-playing system by Fantasy Flight Games. I try and take time when we're doing our first couple checks, some basic mechanics, stuff like that, to introduce the concept uh, to the audience. The second reason why it was built like a tutorial is because two of the players at my table are brand new to role-playing. In fact, this is their very first campaign, so I'm very excited to welcome them and see uh, how they grow as role-players with their characters throughout our story. We will be playing a little bit faster and loose with the rules because story and entertainment is everything for, for us. Because ultimately, role-playing games are truly about having fun, telling stories, and sharing adventures. So without... Without further ado, uh, we'd like to share our adventure, Legacy of Ash. pans down to a wide establishing shot of a blue and green planet called Alderaan. Ships of all shapes and sizes come and go from the planet and off in the distance coming around the, coming around the bend of the planet are a few Mon Calamarian cruisers retrofitted into battleships gliding in orbit. Smaller gun-shaped assault frigates follow in tow gathered around. The screen wipes to a beautiful vista, soaked by, soaked by orange and gold as the sun begins setting over the nearby mountains. A plateau adorned with sweeping gardens and majestic fountains overlooks dizzying heights as the view falls from sight. We cut to the crew of the Maiden of Sabres. Standing forefront in the camera is Captain Tinal Finan, or Tinan Final. A brash Corellian with dark hair, a ragged jawline with weak old with a weak old gruff shadowing his aged features. He bore or sorry, he wears a bomber jacket with the sleeves torn off. He has a tattoo on his shoulder, and he uh, he has a pair of black pants with a yellow stripe running down the sides into his almost knee high fashionable boots. Standing next to him is a Sikian from Hutt Space. Sikians are, uh, they're green, they look very humanoid, they, they kind of have 
They're a little bit skinnier than normal humans, but they also have kind of misshapen heads compared to like human standards. But this uh, this Sikian from Hut Space is known as Ja Vanden. He wears a simple form-fitting uniform, the uniform uh, of his kind of fashionable um, of his people. The natural world colors of browns and dark greens complement his lighter green skin tone. A small toolkit clings to his back, and a blaster and a light blaster rests at his hips. As the air shifts around him, he almost seems to kind of take in the aromas, tracking scents from a distance. The camera cuts to a Zabrak. Her name is Triz. Would you please describe Triz? The first thing people notice about Triz are the tattoos on her face. Not as bold as some of her clanmates from Eridania, she wears her light purple tribal markings with pride. Having come from the wilderness, her clothes reflect more function than form, a blaster rifle resting slung across her back. Perfect. So these three individuals make up the crew of the Maiden of Sabres, a YT-1760 that was recently docked at a nearby uh, docking bay. Um, they walk up to, so they're walking through the gardens and they come upon this kind of grand majestic fountain, water shooting up and kind of cascading off these different tiers. And standing next to the fountain is a young Twi'lek. Would you please describe Ral, Rin, Ral Ray Var? Ral Ray Var is an aqua skin Twi'lek who carries herself lightly. Just by looking at her, you can tell that she's carefree but can be serious when she needs to be. Her dark clothes make her blend in with a crowd but cling to her form in a way that draws sidelong glances. But she's seriously hot. Like super hot. Like super hot. Yeah. Um, Everybody wants her. <laughs> so uh, as the crew approaches, they're meeting up with Rao Revar. The captain had previously been in contact with you. Um, you're looking for uh, transport to Corellia. And so uh, he is currently meeting up with a couple other people. And as he approaches the fountain, he greets you. Um, he's, he looks down at his chronometer, making sure it's the correct time, and he's kind of looking around. You guys know that you were meeting a Duro as well, and there was going to be a third individual for transport who was going to meet you at the local cantina nearby. Uh, missing the Duro, the captain kind of looks around, tells everyone to wait for a few minutes. Uh, after about a minute goes by, he starts to get impatient. Looking around, he sees an old man, an old aged man, uh, a human, kind of down on all fours, gardening with his hands. He's kind of digging out. He has some tools that he's kind of raking the soil with, and he has this, like, young kid about nine years old playing, you know, kind of running around the fountain where you guys are gathered. He kind of almost runs in and bumps into you. He's already, you know, zipping past you, and you're starting to get a little annoyed almost with him. Uh, so the captain kind of hang out for a second. He goes over and he talks to the old man. And he greets the old man with a sort of stiff, almost rehearsed, kind of beautiful weather we're having today. And the old man, without moving, without even looking up, he responds back, Yeah, only if you're an off-worlder. The captain responds with an over-rehearsed, even more stiff. Never heard the nerf herders complain. The old man kind of, <clears throat> kind of straightens himself up, stands up, and kind of brushes off all the soil off of his hands and out, outreaches a, a sort of shaky hand to the uh, captain. The captain greets him and the old man says, Name's Jimma. Captain responds in turn by saying, Captain Fanal, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't happen to be friends with Garen Maddock, would you? The old man says, Seems we share the same friends. Just, uh, the captain gestures to the crew. Uh, or, sorry, the old man gestures to the others standing by the fountain, the kid racing around them, and he says, of course, they'll have to wait here. The captain, nod, the captain nods, calls back, he says, Ja, Triz, keep Ral Revar company, would you? All right. Ja says, yes, of course, Captain, sure thing. Jimma, the old man, calls out to the boy who's now kind of sitting on the edge of the fountain running his fingers through the water. And he says, Cam, I'm going to take this captain here to meet a friend for a moment. Don't pester the travelers too much. And Cam looks at the two of, he looks at the two ladies 
and he looks at Ja, kind of this, this slighter gentleman in the background, distracted by other things going on. And Cam goes, yeah, sure thing, Pampa. The second the, the second the two kind of start walking away, heading off into the distance, almost towards the way you came back to the, the starport, Cam turns to Triz. He says, whoa, cool horns. Thank you. Where'd you get them? I was... They just popped out of her head one day. Whoa, wizard! I wish horns popped out of my head. Did you do anything special? She killed a little boy. <gasps> she probably leave her alone. You killed a little boy? Was it with your blaster rifle? Bare hands. You should try splashing her in water and see what happens. Uh... I don't... <laughs> I don't know if I should. She looks awfully mad. Maybe, How... we'll, maybe we'll calm her down. And then he's, he's kind of staring at you for a second, and he starts giggling. And he goes, you have tails on your head. I, that's not what they are, but I do. Sure. Did they just kind of come out of your head, too? Like her horns? No. They started out small and got bigger as I got bigger. They're can... very, they're very cool. Do they, can they move? Yes. And do you do like a subtle twitch with them or anything? Or probably means fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But he doesn't know that he's a kid. It's no. Fine. They just wiggle and he's like, whoa. <laughs> and you laugh as well in turn, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, he's kind of he's kind of bouncing back between the two of you, asking you questions quickly. You know, quickly wearing out his welcome. And he's like, do either one of you have any cred coins? You can make a wish in the fountain if you want. What I wish for? I wish for more credits. Does that ever work out well for you? I don't know. Pampa pays me allowance once in a while when I help him with gardening. Does it all go into the wishing well? Most of them do. <laughs> okay. But I asked. I wish for more credits, and it's always worked. Uh, what does your papa do? Oh, he's a gardener. Yeah, he he does this for. I mean, he's. He doesn't work anymore. He hasn't worked since my parents disappeared. But he really loves what he does, and everybody really loves Pampa. Do a lot of people come up to him? Yeah, he's he's really famous. He used to he used to fight in the Clone Wars, but he won't tell me much about it. But he's people call him a hero. Pam Pampa Jimma, he's a hero. And uh, so he's kind of smug with himself, kind of kicking his, kicking, he's sitting on the fountain, kicking his feet really hard. Um, still not sure what to say to the Zabrak anymore. Everything he says kind of seems to get more and more disdain. After, after you know, a, a, a moment of silence where it's just kind of like, I'm, I don't really want to talk to this kid anymore. And Jaw seems to be in, in his own mind, kind of getting a feel for the location. Um, you know him, you haven't known him very long, but you know that he's very quiet. Right now he's been acting as a ship's engineer, and he mostly keeps to himself in the back, um, not doing much. You've only been on, been attached to the ship for how long now? Only a couple months. Okay, a couple months, okay. Um, so as you're, as you're kind of hanging out, uh, Cam's data pad just starts beeping, and he kind of has this like giant obnoxious rubber protector around it, so he doesn't drop it, but he kind of pulls out his data pad, and he goes, oh, blast! There's a space battle! And we're going to screen wipe uh, to... It's going to cut up to um, an Imperial hangar bay. And there's just uh, probably about three or four rows of Imperial pilots standing in formation. A commander in the same kind of black armament, uh, the flight helmet at her side. Um, she, she has the markings on her armor of a commander, of a squad commander, and her troops know her as Commander Breeze. She stands, she paces in front of these rows a couple times, and she, she basically, uh, she says, Listen up, troops! Here in a moment we'll be jumping out of hyperspace into rebel-controlled territory. Make no mistake about what you've heard, Alderaan is a hostile planet. It is a bed of terrorism. 
rebel agents strike from Alderaan, routinely cutting off transports, fanning the flames of rebellion. We're going to show, we're going to teach them a lesson today. Here in a moment, we'll be arriving at our destination, and from early scouting reports, there are Mon Calamarian cruisers and assault frigates. Bombers, you will be mostly dealing with the assault frigates early on, dealing with the Mon Calamarian cruisers as the Imperial Star Destroyers get to it. Fighters, you are to make sure that the Y-Wings are top priority. Happy hunting. She kind of addresses each one, you know, um, basically giving a couple uh, squad leaders in the rows last minute commands, giving them their sectors and, and vectors. She gets to the fourth row as the previous three rows are dismissed. She gives your uh, squad leader a sort of uh, briefing real quick, and she looks down the line to a young Corellian standing there with his helmet off to the side. And she says, LS419, keep your music off the comms this time. And she turns and she starts walking away. The camera wipes back to... Alderaan, back to the gardens. You guys are sitting there. Um, he's he's watching. He's looking down at his data pad. What are you guys doing? He kind of mentioned that there was a space battle overhead. What are you looking at, kid? He's like, oh, check it out. There's Imperial Star Destroyers in orbit right now. At least that's what this, this news thing says. Let me see. So as you look down at the data pad, you can see... Um, this kind of uh, news shuttle is filming this uh, Imperial Star Destroyers kind of jump out of orbit and then immediately start letting loose all these TIE Fighter Squadrons. They kind of come about and they just start broadsiding against the Mon Calamarian cruisers. The assault frigates start to kind of fly into position, start lighting up these Imperial Star Destroyers, kind of just start laying out a, a field of spread to try and destroy any fighters coming in. And it looks like just a space battle that's brewing and you know after watching it for about a minute or so you see um a couple more like another star destroyer come out of orbit and for a moment it almost looks like the mon calamari cruisers and the assault frigates are going to win this battle one of the um, imperial star destroyers looks like it's just getting hammered by this coordinated fire and then after a few moments of where it almost looks like these the the alderaan guard is about to win the battle a ton of acclimator class uh these are the kind of almost star destroyers from the clone wars these kind of older uh very much more smaller compared to the imperial star destroyers they start coming out of hyperspace and immediately just start shifting fire and quickly the mon calamarian frigates and the um assault frigates are overwhelmed with fire and off in the distance uh not a cloud in the sky you can almost hear just like the faint sounds of thunder just from these kinds of uh, these ships and like you'll see on this news feed uh, a Mon Calamarian cruiser just break apart and then it kind of the reactor core ruptures the whole thing explodes and then in the faint distance you'll just hear this soft sound of thunder um, so uh, as you're kind of looking down um, you almost the three of you, or the, sorry, the three, uh, Ja, Triz, and Var, almost get this moment of sort of weird nausea. Your stomach starts to churn. Simultaneously, all three of you start to feel sick almost. Um, you know, Var, who's a very lightweight individual, very thin in frame, he, he almost doubles over looking sick, looking visibly sick. And... You're, you're kind of standing over the boy's shoulder looking at his data pad and out of the corner of your eye you're looking down and the water in the fountain is almost falling kind of oddly at first you notice and then as you see some of these beads of water start to fall almost some of them just kind of stop in midair almost like gravity's being reversed for a brief second you see the fountain almost stop in form just holding water in the air and then it all collapses hard and this moment of inertia this moment of sickening feeling kind of disappears and you don't know what it is it, it's almost like a moment kind of ripped in time or something like that and as you're 
as you're looking down, the kid is like standing up and he's staring at the data pad as you're kind of staring at the fountain. And he goes, wow, this is so wizard. And you look down at the data pad and the whole thing is kind of clouded by this giant circle shape now and you can't really make out what it is. And Var kind of taps you on the shoulder and you look up at her and she just points up at the sky. And as you guys are both staring off, Jaw starts to stare off as well. You guys see a moon in orbit that was no, that was not there moments before. What are your thoughts? What do you do? So is there someone else your captain was wanting to pick up before we can get on this ship and get the hell out of here? No. I don't know what <laughs> get out of here? So you did know about one other individual who is in the cantina they were rendezvousing. You have no idea who he is or who they are. Well, there's one more person, but he told us to stay put, and I have to follow my captain's orders. Do you know where this other person is supposed to be? Something about a cantina? There's one right over there. I think it would make your captain pretty happy if we just went and got that other person. Then we could just be ready to go when he gets back. Lead the way. So as you guys kind of look over, you see this kind of squalor cantina called Nerfer's Refuge. It, it kind of has like, um, it, it looks almost dilapidated. It kind of really sticks out like a sore thumb right next to, nestled right next to these gardens. Um, as you guys are kind of getting ready to head over to this uh, cantina, um, you see kind of coming around the corner, you see the captain and Jimma returning and in tow they have a Duro, uh, kind of these green alien looking individuals. And you also see this old beat up astromech coming around the corner too. Um, the Duro wears simple clothes, looking more inconspicuous than fashionable. He carries himself with a sense of unease about him. As he approaches, he also too stares up at the moon in orbit. The astromech kind of putzes around right next to him at his side. He has, he is, uh, he has a layered trapezoidal head uh, and a box-shaped torso that leans forward on two arms, and he has this little wheel behind him that propels him forward. He, uh, he's predominantly orange, but you're not sure if it's orange or rust at this point. He uh, sports sections, of, uh, sections of, and plates of black or gray. Um, he has this kind of short, round viewing sensor that protruding from the top front of his head, and uh, it has a dull yellow glow kind of staring ahead. He seems to just kind of be all nice and slow, keeping pace with the Duro, um, not really looking around, just kind of keeping pace. The captain, as he walks up, he's kind of glancing up, glancing around. He looks like he's pretty much ready to go. He. Uh, points over the Nerfer's Refuge, right where you guys were about to head, and he, he kind of instructs you guys, we're picking up one more and we're getting the crank out of here. Uh, once we're underway, he turns to you and he goes, the Duro and the Astromech are not to be bothered. He turns to Jaw, he goes, you got me? We, the less questions asked, the better. Yes, sir. If all goes well, we'll be within, we'll be, we'll be at Corelli in a couple days, 10,000 credits richer for it. So, uh, he looks over, and Cam is patting the droid on the on the top of his dome. And he's like, what's your name? And the droid goes, womp, womp, womp. He's like, he turns, he turns and looks at the Duro, and the Duro says, his name is Vox. And Cam kind of looks looks from the Duro back to the droid, and he goes, why is he so sad? He goes, well, <laughs> he's not sad. He's He has a restraining bolt on. Uh, without it, he turns into quite the scamp. He kind of chuckles, and he goes, they that, and he never shuts up. So we put this on him, it keeps him kind of mellow. Um, there's another loud thunder clap that reminds everyone of what's going on, you know, the kind of urgency of the situation. So the captain shakes the old man Jim's hand. He kind of gives Cam a, a wave and he thanks you for keeping uh, his crew uh, company. And he leads you guys towards the Nerfer's Revenge. Or sorry, Refuge. <laughs> so um, we're going to cut over to... As you guys walk in, the door slides open, you guys step in, and the kind of weapon scanners go off. They flag each one of you with weapons, and the bartender, who's 
kind of cleaning this uh, mug. He just kind of looks up, sees who's coming in, and then Droid will have to wait at the door. Okay, so they, you guys kind of come in, um, and the captain walks in, he kind of scans the room, and he finds a Clatoonian, the Clatoonian he's looking for. Uh, would you be so kind as to describe your character now? Uh, sitting at a table in the corner is a Clatoonian, looking like many of his people. He has thin, dark brown fur covering most of his body, and atop his head is just kind of a gray skull cap. Um, situated square in his face are two brown eyes that seem to allude to a higher level of thinking than is usually accustomed to his people. He wears, wears a dirty, faded blue jumpsuit with oil-stained protective leathers and thick gloves paired with stained hands, all obvious clues to his profession. Perfect. Uh, the captain kind of pulls up next to you, or he walks up next to you. You're sitting down having a drink, I'm assuming. He turns to you and goes, you about ready to go? You in some kind of hurry? We should be. Have you, have you looked out the window lately? And almost on cue, there's this sound of engines buzzing. This engines kind of, um, and then, so you guys kind of all get up, walk over to this kind of larger round bay window, and this buzzing through the transparent steel window is growing louder and louder until you see three Lambda shuttles kind of almost come up over the edge of the cliff and just almost surprise the, the, the little area right here. And, uh, the Lambda kind of lowers its cannon, blasts one of the fountains so it has a clear place to land, and just sets down almost exactly where you guys were standing moments ago. Two other Lambda-class shuttles land it off to the side as well, and stormtroopers just start pouring out of these two kind of farther away Lambda-class shuttles. The, the closer one, the, the ramp goes down, and a woman in a white Imperial uniform walks calmly, uh, authoritatively, down the ramp. A sort of air of command about her as the engines start start to power down you can see like the the wind from the engines blowing through her like fierce red hair there wasn't she, supposed to be this kind of trouble captain you're telling me man uh, I'm not paying extra for this well if we get out of here we won't have to worry about it you as you're looking out the window you see the woman reach a calm up to her mouth and in a booming voice amplified by the Lambda-class shuttles, she calls out, We're here for the terrorist known as Garen Maddock. Information leading to his apprehension will be rewarded. Resistance or obstruction will be in our search will be met with severe consequences. Once we have Maddock in our possession, we will leave in peace. The captain turns to the Duro and sighs. So much for leaving quietly. As you guys are kind of watching, the stormtroopers are pouring out, fanning out. Another squad of stormtroopers walks down the ramp, standing right next to this Imperial woman, and they surround her, almost forming some sort of defensive barrier, kind of half circle around her. The woman stands there holding her calm, waiting patiently for something to happen. And after a moment, she gives a signal, and stormtroopers just start racing out to local people and just, you know, start, like, grabbing them and starting to a care game. You can't hear what's going on through the transparent steel windows, but you can see that these stormtroopers are in somewhat of a hurry to find this uh, Garen Maddock. The camera kind of zooms in on two stormtroopers as they approach Jimma and Cam. They have their blaster rifles in hand and they start shoving the old man, almost gun to chest, and it pushes really hard on the old man. He, he kind of barrels backwards, catches himself and sort of trips and falls down and hits his head on the uh, Duracreet below. And Cam just gets furious and he just charges one of the stormtroopers and runs right into him. And But this stormtrooper is twice, three times his size. So he kind of runs into him, he's trying to bully him, he starts throwing punches at the stormtrooper, and the stormtrooper uh, is trying to peel him off, but this darn kid is just clinging to him, angry about what he did to his pampa. So the other stormtrooper comes over and almost like just rips this kid down to the ground uh, with, with the aid of the other guy. And Cam starts to get up, and he starts to race over. He's racing back, and he's about to clobber the same stormtrooper again, and the stormtrooper just hits him with the blunt end of his weapon just right across the face. At this point, 
the old man starts to raise up and he kind of climbs forward to his knees, unable to uh, kind of rise up to his feet. He's kind of holding his head and he's, he's gesturing, like begging them to stop. You know, poor Cam just hit the ground hard, weapon crossed his face. And the old man is begging these stormtroopers to, uh, to just ease up, take a moment. One of the stormtroopers puts the barrel of his rifle right up to the old man's forehead. And the old man is shaking his head. He's, his hands have surrendered. He's shaking his head. Whatever they're asking him, he's, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what to say. And you see Cam start to get up a third time. And the stormtrooper's holding the blaster to his head. And he's staring at Jimma. And he aims the weapon down, looks back at Jimma, and pulls the trigger. Shoots Cam in the back. The little boy's frame collapses back onto the ground, not struggling to climb back up again. The old man, they train the weapon back on his forehead, and the old man just howls out in pain so loud that you can hear it sort of reverberating through the transparent steel glass. You see the Duro, Garen, punch the wall right in front of you guys, and he's just furious. He's shaking his head in anger and he turns to the captain and he he says in a hushed voice that you're probably right next to the captain so only you and the captain can hear he says please take vox to corellia my people will take it from there the captain nods casually accepting the the charge but garen grabs his shoulder fiercely and he says tanan I cannot stress to you enough how important this droid is. He's more important than my life. He's he's more important than yours. And Tanan kind of smug, you know, he does that crooked Corellian smile for a moment, and then he realizes that Garen is being serious. And Garen says, he's the reason the Imperials are here. They won't stop until they have the information he possesses. The captain, the captain in turn, clasps Garen's shoulders back, and he says, I promise I will protect this droid with my life. Garen steps to leave, and the captain stops him, grasping his shoulder even tighter, and he says, Garen, may the force be with you. And Garen responds, always. And then he storms out of the cantina. You've never, you've only been with this captain for a couple months, and you've known him to be quite odd. But you've never heard him say this before. You've never, yeah. I mean, you, you don't know him all that well as much as you've spent some time with him. But um, that kind of struck you off. That's something that you've never really heard. That's not a greeting that most people use. As you turn back to the transparent window, watching out into the courtyard, you see the uh, you see the Duro kind of slowly approach, and he kind of has his hands out. Looking very incons or like looking very unassuming, very un uh, threatening or non threatening, and as he walks up, he approaches the woman in the the white imperial uniform. His hands raised to his shoulders. Stormtroopers just turn and just start aiming at him. Uh, he's as he's walking up, calmly, coolly. Everyone's heads snap off to the side as a land speeder cruises by. And on the back is a rebel soldier, and he has a like an auto turret cannon, and he just starts boom, 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 just laying fire across the courtyard. All of these Lambda shuttles, the stormtroopers, all the stormtroopers jump behind cover, and they start returning fire, some of them throwing frag grenades towards the land speeder. And in a moment, you're looking, and almost kind of in horror, you see the Lambda of the Imperial officer, the gun the gun under the nose just turn and goo 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 <laughs> just blows the land speeder off the map uh, there's a giant explosion right after the and then a, a kind of twinge of fireball that you can almost see out the edge as you're kind of leaning in over to watch this kind of battleground unfold right in front of you and in this moment of kind of confusion the land speeder swooping around the side um, you see the rebel or you see the uh, Garen draw a pistol from his hip and he fires two shots at the Imperial officer. And you, it's hard to see what's going on through this window, through all the chaos and mayhem, but the, the shots just boom, boom, hit her center mast right after each other. And they ricochet away. And a shimmer of blue 
that kind of is encapsulating her ripples for a moment and then disappears. You see her draw her weapon return and fire two stun blasts. These kind of rippling out, almost like sonic, briefly visible rings that strike this Duro and he collapses down to the ground. The first one drops him and the second one puts him down and she does one more either and as she does one more a sort of snide smile forms upon her face this kind of cruel scramble his brains one more time kind of shot comes out she gestures for two stormtroopers to come grab him they grab this kind of unconscious lifeless duro and start dragging him to the ship and uh, by this point the lambda shoots the land speeder explodes and uh, she boards the lambda walking up the ramp her, her hair once again blowing in the wind as the Lambda's engines start to power up. Her personal guard, or at least what's left of it after the turret had kind of laid waste to the troopers, kind of leave their cover, bounce up the ramp. The Lambda's ramp goes up and it starts to lift off. The wings deploy back down as it starts to kind of haul out of there for atmosphere, heading back to wherever it came from. So in that moment, um, you guys are kind of watching this this whole kind of scene unfold in, in almost what seems like mere moments, this kind of rebel uprising that's almost immediately suppressed. Um, and in that moment, you guys turn and you look at the two stormtroopers who were recently standing near Jim and Cam. They kind of reach up and they touch the sides of their helmets and you see them nod. And then they turn and they look right at the Nerfer's refuge and they start walking in or they start walking towards it. You guys are all standing at the window gawking, you know, everyone in here has seen you guys with the the Duro that was just taken out and just ca apprehended. You guys are a little worried about these Imperial Stormtroopers coming in and seeing you guys all at the window. So you only have a few moments to kind of hide, um, disappear, uh, do whatever you can to, to not stick out like a sore thumb. So um, we're going to kind of open it up. And uh, how is everyone going to be as inconspicuous at this canteen as possible? I am going to go sit down with some customers that are already there. Okay, so you're just going to jump in a table and play it cool? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, you see the captain. He just kind of walks right up to the bar and orders a drink. Um, you, you jump down to a table uh, with some patrons next to you. Um, what would you like to do? Their back door. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. He said the captain already sat down at the bar. Yeah, so he's he just sits down at a stool, cool as a cucumber. He orders a drink. I would jump behind and start making whatever drink he ordered or whatever Perfect. I think the drink so, is that he ordered. So you run up, slide over, real real cool like slide over of the course. bar, drop down, kind of get it, take a moment to familiarize yourself, pull out a glass and just start mixing a drink. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you like to do? I guess you're already sitting down, but you stood up to kind of take a look. You're, you're, you know that like you didn't come in with these guys, but every single person here has seen you with these guys, so it might still be in your best interest. I walk up to the bar and toss a couple of credits, and then go over to one of the hollow projectors and just hit it with a wrench, and then start fixing it. Okay, fair enough. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So you're, so you're you're the the maintenance repair man. Perfect. All right, so. Um, and uh, you see, you see Vox kind of anyone who looks over, you see him kind of start to get real tall and skinny, and he starts like just pretending he's part of the wall almost, just kind of, <laughs> just kind of straightening himself up, but also being as inconspicuous as possible. Moments later, the two stormtroopers walk in, and uh, they're they're kind of you know have weapons at ready. They start scanning the cantina, <clears throat> looking for anyone who might be suspicious any other rebel sympathizers or rebel troopers that might be in here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to have everyone make our first check of the campaign. Um, we're going to be doing uh, different checks, so I know you're kind of sitting down with some people. Um, we're going we're gonna to either make that a deception. Uh, let me take a look here. So I guess what, what check do you think that would work out to be? A deception. Okay, so we're going to have you do a deception. We're going to have you as well do a deception, pretending to be the bartender, as the other bartender's looking at you. He's about to yell at you, and then the troopers come in, and he shuts right up and just gets back to his job. I'm going to have you do a mechanics check. Obviously, the better you look like you know what you're doing, the more convincing you're going to be. 
Uh, would you actually prepare me a stealth check for a astromech? Yeah. Uh, that yeah, astromech I'll... agility. <laughs> yeah. One? Yeah. I mean, Probably. So you start you... out with the green yeah, of so... your main skill, and then you a uh, yellow for each rank that you have in that, correct? Yep. Let me get him this astromech droid card real quick. Um, so, with us doing our first skill check of the game, I'm going to basically do a quick run through. Um, so, we're going to be using the. Uh, let's do your deception as the base example. So, whenever we're doing a skill check in this game, we're going to we're going to look at the skill that we're going to be using. In this case, it's deception. Now, next to deception, it has a parenthetical characteristic that it references, and these characteristics are kind of who you are as a person, while your skills are who you are through your experiences, right? So we have deception, and you have how many ranks in deception? I have two ranks in deception. Perfect. So we're going to keep that two in mind, and your deception references your cunning, cunning characteristic. Which I have three. You have a two and a three. So now in this case, what we do is we take whichever dice pool is higher, right? So in this in this case, your number three is higher, and that builds the base dice pool of three greens. Okay. Now for every rank you have, or the secondary number, which is two, for every rank you have, you're going to update uh, upgrade two greens to two yellows. Okay. So um, there will also be circumstantial modifiers, which we'll come back to in a moment. So right now we have used your two ranks in cunning, or in uh, deception, deception, to upgrade your three points in cunning. So. What are we looking at for your deception dice pool? Two green. Okay, and you have no ranks in deception. Um, your mechanics is looking like what? Four green initially. Okay. With two ranks making it two and two. Perfect. So two green, two yellow. And what is the astromech looking like for stealth? Uh, the astromech only has an agility of one. And, okay. Uh, has no stealth skill. <laughs> okay, perfect. So he is not. Then, however, uh, however, we are entering this kind of opportunity for circumstantial modifiers, right? So, with this circumstance, they might not be looking for a droid, right? They're looking for rebel sympathizers. Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to do. I am going to give uh, Vox two blue boost dice. He turns his lights off. <laughs> <laughs> he turns his lights off. He's in a corner, right? A shadowy corner, even. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not looking for a droid. So, in fact, I'd make that three boost dice, right? Okay. He powers off. He's a droid. And he's uh, in a shadowy corner. Now, um, you're sitting at a table, so um, let's go ahead and uh, give you a boost and a setback. Now, you're getting the boost because you're with other people, so you, you look like you're part of a party. The setback is these other two are kind of looking at you like, what do you want? What are you doing? You know, uh, don't get me in trouble, too, you know? So the setback dice is opposite the boost, so anytime you have a circumstantial benefit from the boost, in this case, sitting down at a table, looking like you belong, the setback is some other negative circumstance that's throwing your game off or making, drawing attention to you. Now for you, you'll also, uh, you definitely have a setback from the bartender. Now, is there an instance why you think you would get a boost? I don't <laughs> It's not going to be on your character sheet. <laughs> this is more thematics, right, okay. in the situation. Who's right in front of you that just ordered a drink? The captain. So Perfect. he's gonna he's gonna talk to me or at least pretend like I made exactly. the right thing. Exactly. Exactly. So and because you two have at least talked to each other before, you you sort of have that at least somewhat repertoire of interacting with each other. So you're gonna have a boost from that. Um, now technically, I should be rolling a uh, cool for the captain, but because um, I'm just gonna leave it up to the players for this skill check to see what happens, um, then we'll go ahead and roll. So everybody, your <laughs> difficulty. I just drop that uh oh, your difficulty will be uh, it will be two purples as a base. Uh, the, so this is a average difficulty. The stormtroopers are heading in and they're they're looking for rebel sympathizers. So they're they're perceiving, they're looking around, they're clearly actively looking for people that don't belong. And there's a couple people here who look like they don't belong. <laughs> However, they will have a setback because they don't know what you guys look like. Now that setback, because this is a difficulty and they're not actively perceiving, this uh, this difficulty will translate into a boost for everyone. Okay. Is that already counted in mine? No. Nope. Okay. So everybody will add a boost, and if there's not enough dice, then we'll roll um, okay. at different times. So go ahead and roll your deception, and if you're ready, go ahead and roll I it need as well. Another boost. Okay. There. All right. Now when we're looking at our dice, there are four different symbols 
up to six different yeah. symbols, but as the basics, we're just going to be looking so far simple. at successes and failures. Now, successes and failures, the success is a sort of blast icon. The failure is a sort of triangle icon. Those cancel each other out. And on the inverse, there's lesser icons uh, as advantage and disadvantage. The disadvantage sort of looks like a imperial symbol or a or sort of circular window. And the advantage symbol is wings with a dot in the middle. So the wings with the dot in the middle and the imperial symbols will cancel each other out. Yep. Whenever we're canceling out dice, we can just go ahead and pull them off to the side to see what we're left with. Now in this case, where you do have the threat and the advantage, we can go ahead and cancel this out and shift your dice to what's remaining, right? So I have three advantage, right? You have three success. Three success. Penguin is advantage. Yep. Okay. Uh, so you, you appear to have three successes. You have... Two successes and two threat. Okay, perfect. Or two advantage, sorry. Uh, so go ahead and um, you have all your dice necessary. You need, I a, need a green and blue. Okay, so let's get him a green and a blue. Do I get a boost because I know exactly what's wrong with this machine? Because <laughs> <laughs> you just hit it. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a boost. If, if you feel you want one. <laughs> I think I do. Okay. Uh, although I might have to give you a setback because the the bartender slash manager is still staring at you because you, because <laughs> you just destroyed his tele <laughs> his holovid display. Give me more. Yeah, I need a boost dice. Okay, so Vox got two success and three advantage. Oh, he is he is yeah. He's he cool is, as a cucumber. <laughs> he, he was born in the shadows. Well, mere, while some adopt the shadows as their own, he was born in them. I have two success and three advantage. Perfect. So everybody has success and some have advantage. So now in this case, everybody passes. So what's going to happen is the stormtroopers are going to leave. But before we get to that, we're going to do some uh, some slight uh, analyzing of our dice of our dice pool. And for anyone who has that has an extra advantage or in or in the chance that we had any threat, you would let me know. Uh, what that means. So you succeeded with how much advantage? Two advantages. So what would you like that two advantage to go to? Um, can one of them be that I just kind of reach over and grab the other person's drink and take a drink and he just doesn't do anything? A absolutely. Drink? <laughs> in fact, in fact, it's yeah. a Corellian yeah. rum and it is delicious. Ooh. Yeah. So you reach over, you grab this, uh, it's almost like a couple, you know, mm -hmm. going out to, they're like slumming it tonight for date night, and uh, so you meet up with them, and mm -hmm. you sit down, immediately just grab mm -hmm. one of the drinks, take a drink from it, a, a much yeah. more longer drink than they were hoping or expecting, and they're, they're not going to say anything. Yeah, you have a very That's big frame nice. and a you know, blaster pit, a blaster rifle at your side, so Four perfect. Vox has three advantage. Vox pulls a blanket over his head. <laughs> <laughs> he has a little claw arm come out, and there's like a blanket. You know, it, it was maybe like a drink towel that was used to clean up a mess, and he just pulls it over his head. And as they're as they're walking up, they pay even less mind to him. Um, perfect. The hollow projector was a little grainy to begin with. Ooh. So I've actually fixed it better than it was working before. <laughs> and as you walk past the bar, you collect one of the credits back. I take yeah. them all back. I, I did him a service. <laughs> Fair enough. Perfect. So the stormtroopers who are standing there, they, they do a quick scan of the room, maybe a, a double take, kind of eyeballing everybody, taking a moment, and then they reach up. They, they turn to each other. They go, time for extraction. And they kind of back out of the cantina, turn around, and every, everybody, or at least some of you, take a collective sigh of relief. As they leave, they march over to one of the other lambdas that was waiting for the, the stragglers, the Imperial stragglers, or collecting the Imperial stormtroopers that had been shot by the uh, Landspeeder's turret, and they start collecting, and then eventually they board up, the ramp goes up, they fly off, right? You guys are left in the cantina, you finish the drink, delicious. Um, who checks on Vox? Mostly, it would probably be, I guess, so the captain turns over and he pulls this blanket off, this, like, wet towel <laughs> off of Vox. And this, this towel just stinks. It just stinks, <laughs> and it's wet, and it's, you know, it's, it's moist. Vox refuses to boot back up. <laughs> yeah, Vox, yeah. He's, like, shaking Vox and He's Vox. waiting for a very Dave Sex Machina moment to boot back up. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, the captain kind of turns to everybody, and, uh... He, he turns and he looks at the Katoonian, he goes, well, I think that's our cue to go. As we're running out of the cantina, 
there's a quick moment of Jimma, the old man, kind of clutching this little boy, Cam, in his arms, and he's just kind of really sad, really mad, angry, and you almost, you almost see this sort of fiery resilience in him, this, the same of someone who probably did a lot of heroic things in the Clone Wars, and you see him kind of lifting up, like rising his ragged frame with Cam in his arms, and he's just looking mad, and he's looking like he's wanting revenge against the Imperials that did this to his grandson. And as you guys kind of run by, heading out, um, you guys race to your ship, and basically the, the, the camera just jump cuts to you guys in, your, in this YT-1760, uh, known as the Maiden of Sabres. It fires up and flies out. And as it's flying out, kind of heading out of the atmosphere, the, the night growing darker as you guys are flying. Uh, it had been sunset when you arrived, but now it's almost nighttime. You guys are flying out, you break through the atmosphere, you're flying out, you look over through this kind of front, this front uh, window, you pick up your visual scanning, as they say, um, and you look over and you see this massive moon, and the more you look at it, in fact, they even bring up a, a more compounded digital zoom on one of the com command consoles of the 1760. And it almost looks like this man-made kind of creation, this giant moon. Um, and as you're scanning it, as you're looking at it, it starts to power up in some interesting way. Jaw is in the back, or he's in the cockpit as well kind of running uh, sensor scans, and he just turns to Captain and he goes, Captain, this is, this is incredible. The power readings being generated by this, the, by this station or by this moon is just off the charts. Our, our computers can't even begin to calculate it. And in a moment, as you're staring at this, you're staring at the command console, you, you, you look back out to this moon, and you see these kind of green lights, very distant, start to formulate this kind of triangle and you just this giant green laser reaches out from this moon strikes the planet of Alderaan and in a moment there's a giant explosion Jaws looking down at the sensors and this siren just starts going off the ship's internal siren starts going off and the captain just punches the throttle whatever, whatever just happened we're getting out of here he says, Ja, he, he turns to his engineer and he says, I need you in the back right now. Ja races back. He gets on the comms and he says, passengers, go ahead and buckle up. We might be in for a little bit of a rough ride. So as he, as Ja's running back there, he says, Ja, when you get back, I need you to reroute all power to rear deflector shields. Do it immediately. And right as the sensors shift the shields to the rear deflectors, debris from the planet strikes the ship. And at first, it's just this little, this almost sort of pebbles on metal sound. And then a giant chunk shows up on the centers, sensors just for a second. And then it strikes the rear of your ship. And in that moment, you feel the ship shudder. You know, some of you are almost thrown off your feet. And you hear this giant explosion in the back. And the captain gets on the comms. And he says, Ja, damage report! And there's silence. And more alarms start going off. Breach alarms. You know, the hole has been breached. It's not um, the, the kind that would, like, vent out all the oxygen. But the engines, kind of, you almost hear the power of the ship just... Boom, sort of shutting down. And then the lights flicker. Backup emergency power kicks on. And the mistress's engines completely cut off and the ship almost lurches for a moment, and then you feel this kind of, the ship sort of almost lose, lose gravity for a moment. The back generators kick back on, like I said, and then you can tell that your ship is just dead in the water, right? And in a moment, your shields start to flicker on a bit, and then you get struck by two more shots of something. This, another explosion ruptures, this kind of over, like on the, the top of the ship, as two TIE fighters just scream past the display in the front. And as you're looking around, these two small TIE fighter silhouettes 
blaze past. Now, in this moment, uh, we cut to the interior of a TIE fighter. It has the Imperial pilot with this black armor outfit on, the flight helmet, and he zips by. It shows the same thing. Uh, he's flying by, and his wingman TIE fighter fires two directly into the top of the ship. And uh, the, the TIE fighter pilot is bringing up, he's, type, he's punching in something in his display console, and on the camera focuses down on the console, and the display reads, YT-1760, transponder code, Mistress of Sabres. And there's, a, there's that giant explosion as the wingman lights up the mistress, and the sensors read, shields offline on this TIE fighter pilots and and they're they're kind of doubling around for another pass and as the light as they're kind of starting to head out starting to swoop around for another pass the comms on the comms panel there's a light a yellow light that starts flashing and so the TIE fighter pilot flips on the comms and he hears the a human voice start to fill out a panicked human voice call out uh, ceasefire Imperial fighters we are a simple transport ship heading to the mid rim. Uh, we have nothing to do with whatever's going on here. Please cease fire. What do you do? Um, I transfer comms back to uh, the Death Star. Commander Breeze, I have a civilian ship here. What would you like me to do? If they are, uh, Commander Breeze gets on and she says, if the freighter is firing or hostile, destroy it. If it is, if it is uh, merely trying to flee, we are, uh, I'm sorry, she would say, um, any ships that are fleeing the sector must be apprehended at all costs. Do not destroy if not necessary. And you can almost immediately hear her, like, comms kind of switch off, and you, you hear your wingman call over, and he's like, he's like, he says, uh, he says, "Criff, that we should blow these. We should blow this rebel scum out of the sky." Hold it, XT eight hundred one. She said, "No lethal force." Yeah, Just well, disable the engines, and we'll bring them in. Yeah, well, these are the same people that lit down those those guys down on the planet. Did you hear about that speeder? Yeah, I heard some news, but yeah, what about those Y wings that shot up your your friend earlier today? You're just gonna let these guys get off with it? The Y wings are different. Not everyone out there is an enemy, 801. Just bring them in and we'll take them hostage. Fine, but you're doing the paperwork on this. Like you've done a single paperwork in your life, 801. <laughs> Calm shut off. He does it, it like in the half, in the first half of your, like you've ever done paperwork, click, right? <laughs> and then he kind of eases up, he throttles down, and uh, you, you still have the captain on the line. He hasn't heard anything that's been said. You mm -hmm. just kind of have him on hold, on space hold, if you will. Yeah. Uh... Captain of the Mistress of Sabres, power off your engines and we will bring you in. You kind of hear a, a slight chuckle and he goes, Okay, Imperial TIE Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Imperial Fighter. We, uh, engines are powered off. <laughs> and, uh, we cut back to the inside where he's on the comms and he goes, Okay, Imperial Fighter, engines are powered off. And he kind of looks around to anyone who's in the cockpit. Just kind of a moment of terror, a moment of panic, and you start to feel the ship almost lurch as the tractor beam locks on to the Mistress of Sabres and starts pulling the YT-1760 towards the small moon. And with that, we will call it our first session. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you had an amazing time during this episode of Legacy of Ash. And if you're interested in continuing this adventure, please subscribe. Uh, if you had a great time and want to let us know about it, uh, leave us a comment in the section below or just give us a thumbs up. Now we'll be back with the next episode of Legacy just as soon as I finish editing it, which hopefully will be within the next week. Uh, so until then, tell a story, share an adventure. It's a hostile planet. <laughs> an ugly planet. planet. It's an ugly oh, bug planet. planet. A bug planet. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break. All right. And we'll get back to it. <laughs>